Thank you, Hannah. Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to those who, um, for the participants and speakers who are already in the room, we're going to start in a few minutes. We're just going to let um, um, everyone in. All right, just a couple more minutes. Hi, Chinky. Thanks for joining. Good to see you here. Okay, I think um, I think let's start now. It's good to start. Um, um, I'd like to thank everyone for coming in on time, and I know people are are going to come in as we um, in the next uh, few minutes or so. Um, good evening, good afternoon, Slamat malam. I hope you guys uh, you are you are well wherever you are. Thank you for taking the time to join us. We're very thankful and appreciate you being here. My name is Florence Armain. I'm the country coordinator for Internews Earth Journalism Network or EGN. To those not familiar with the organization, EGN is both a global network of environmental journalists and a media program implementer. We carry out activities such as workshops, uh, develop training materials and tools. Uh, we give reporting and media grants and fellowship programs for journalists to report from global environmental forums and webinars such as this to enable and empower journalists from developing countries to report on the environment more effectively. And our webinar today, we will focus on heavy metal contamination. What are they? What's the current state? What's the progress? 
the impacts, um, efforts that are being done to tackle the issue and how journalists and media through their reporting of the issue can not only push for to increase awareness, better policy, but also just as important is to uh, push for better recognition of the interconnectedness um, of human, animal and environmental health or what we know as One Health. Um, an approach that prioritizes coordination, collaboration, and, and communication across disciplines to address uh, shared um, common threats, in, including environmental contamination. So this is an introductory webinar, um, uh, one that we hope, uh, among others, to get you hooked on the issue, to increase and improve your understanding of heavy metal and exposure and its impacts, and recognize uh, and, and uh, stories in your community that you can report on, you can dig, you can develop, you can investigate, and of course, to connect you with four wonderful speakers today. And but before before we start, uh, allow me to remind you that we will take um, questions along with the present along during the presentation and after. And, and for this, please use the Q&A feature um, at the bottom of your screen and not the chat feature for this purpose. And please set your name, your media organization or organization, who you are and, and, uh, and which uh, panelists you're addressing your questions to. And we will get to the experts to answer them later. But please uh, do use the chat feature to let us know who you are, where you're from, any feedback, information you'd like to share. Um, we'd love to hear from you. And uh, my colleague, um, Hannah, uh, will, be, will also be posting information um, on the chat box um, as well. Um, so we'll move on to our first speaker. Uh, our first speaker today is uh, Rachel Kupka. She's the Executive Director of the Global Alliance on Health and Pollution. Um, she has more than 15 years of experience in a nonprofit program management, development, and fundraising. And before joining GAP, um, she worked for Pure Earth and the Wildlife Conservation um, Society. So Rachel holds an MA in International Political Economy and Development from Fordham University and a Certificate in Conservation Biology from Columbia University. Um, Rachel, you, you'll have the mic. Great, thank you so much. Allow me just one minute here to get my PowerPoint going. <clears throat> Okay, great. So hopefully you can all see this. <laughs> all right, great. So thank you, Florence, Hannah, and the Internews Earth Journalism Network for organizing this webinar today. It's an incredibly important topic and very compelling. Uh, it's uh, one of the one of my favorite things to do is talk about what we do. So glad to be here. Uh, we'll be talking today about the impacts of pollution on global health, kind of what it means for One Health and what our organization, the Global Alliance on Health and Pollution, is, is working toward uh, on this issue. And to just to get you started by quick way of background, GAP is an internationally focused network that's working to strengthen the global response to health and pollution issues. This is a topic that had not really been on the international development agenda until quite recently, um, quite in part due to the efforts of our alliance and its many partners. So we are formed from different UN agencies, such as UN Environment Program, UN Development Program, and several ministries of environment and health from low and middle income countries. We are here today, thanks in part to our donors, the Ministry of Environment of Sweden and the Swiss Agency for Development and Cooperation. So thanks to them. So we are here talking about heavy metal contamination and pollution, which is a terribly underrecognized global issue. And just to give you a bit of background, when we talk about pollution, what we from the Global Alliance on Health and Pollution are talking about are these things that you see up here, household air pollution, ambient air pollution, water pollution from the chemical side of things, not really the water and sanitation agenda so much, but that is included. Soil pollution, 
occupational health and safety issues, um, and chemicals such as lead, mercury, pesticides, and arsenic and others. And through the work that our alliance and its partners have been doing, it's become increasingly clear uh, that pollution is on the rise. And it's quite well known to adversely impact human health, biodiversity, there's links with climate change, um, ecosystem health impacts, and all of that. And because of these links, pollution is now recognized by the UN Environment Program as one of these triumvirate of uh, pollution, uh, excuse me, a planetary crises upon which the sustainability of our planet depends. So biodiversity, climate change, and pollution. You can kind of think of these three as the pillars of a stool upon which you know we're, we're worried about uh, our own ability to survive. And of course, that of all the species that inhabit this earth. And yet when we look at pollution compared to climate and biodiversity issues, it's really the one that's lagging in international attention and resources. So we are a good audience to be speaking with today. I wanted to go a little bit into what impacts pollution has on health and how it impacts health and why pollution is such a complex issue for us to report and talk about because um, I'm sure you've heard the age old adage, the dose makes the poison, but what does that really mean? Okay, so when we think about what causes death, right, you have a, a disease that causes death or on your death certificate or a family member's death certificate, you will have listed a cause of death. Well, you will almost never ever see pollution as a cause of death. And that's because exposures to pollution are a risk factor for death, right? Um, so an exposure to pollution can cause a disability or cause a death pr uh, premature later in life. I mean, it's very hard to tie these things together. And that's why there's uh, a lot of research going on to establish what's this dose response relationship. And so it's important to keep in mind that the risk for illness or disability or death from exposures to pollution is a factor of many things. How toxic is the pollutant you are exposed to? How long were you exposed? How much were you exposed to? Because all contaminants are not equal in how toxic they are. Were you exposed to a lot all at once in a short period of time, acute? Or were you exposed to a lot or a little bit over a longer period of time? Was it a chronic exposure? All of these differences will have an impact on how an illness or disease or death is manifest, right? Some toxicants, that's a tiny, tiny amount, will kill you straight away, where others takes a lot to cause cancer or to cause heart attacks or hardening of the arteries. So these things are all things that we need to keep in mind. There are also multiple exposure pathways. You can inhale toxicants, you can absorb it through your skin and you can digest it, right? These are all different ways that we, our bodies are exposed. Um, and these things are not usually something you're gonna notice right away, unless of course there's immediate death or death from a, a short amount of exposure, okay? you So we kind of refer to pollution as this silent killer, right? It's in the background, it's something we're exposed to all the time and we don't really notice it. Um, and because it's hard to tie a particular point of exposure to an illness or death later in life, with few exceptions, um, we typically wouldn't even notice the exposures to pollution until symptoms present. And so there's also this other aspect of subclinical symptoms where <clears throat> low levels of exposures might be causing something like IQ damage or some neurotoxic effects that don't really manifest very clearly. So it might look like a child having a learning disability, for instance, or it might cause Alzheimer's later in life. But that's, you know, these subclinical symptoms that you wouldn't necessarily know until it gets really bad. And so there's this threshold at which we start seeing clinical symptoms where a person feels bad enough to actually go and visit their health practitioner and say, I'm not feeling well. And then we'll say, well, let's get to the bottom of it too. Okay, so who's most impacted? Well, it turns out we are all impacted. Pollution does not discriminate in how it impacts any one particular group, but we do see alarming trends. 
Um, both young and old people are, uh, are impacted by pollution and the deaths, as you can see from this chart, are really occurring in young children and later on in life. So in the, the from the 40s to the 70s range, okay? Men, women, and children are all affected, but at different ways and in different trends. Men are typically more exposed in an occupational setting, right? They're working in dirtier environments, perhaps, than women are, but this is not always the case. Women are typically more exposed in the home because they have cook stoves at home, but they also are working with contaminated materials and their livelihoods uh, issues. Children are exposed in many different ways. They're exposed in the home, they're exposed at school, they're exposed on they walk to school, they are exposed if they are accompanying their parents in the workplace. And of course, if they are also working in hazardous work environments, so I mean, we have child labor rights here as well, you know, they're going to be exposed this way. So turns out it's really an environmental justice issue because when you look at who's more exposed than other groups, it's definitely the poor and the vulnerable and minority communities that you know cannot afford to drive to work in a uh, air conditioned vehicle or have air conditioning in the home or afford to work at you know or have enough education to be able to have a desk job where they're not exposed to heavy metals or air pollution on a regular basis so why are children though of all these groups the most sensitive and it's because children are not small adults their bodies are growing. They have a greater exposure risk proportionate to how big they are, right? They eat, if you, any of you have kids, you know these kids eat a lot of food. So if they're getting exposures through their food, they're getting it in a higher dose than an adult is. They drink more water per day. They have hand to mouth activities. So if their hands are getting lead or other contaminants on them, they're putting them in their mouth. Um, and their bodies are still growing and have a lesser ability to process those toxicants, okay? So, and they um, also have a longer life ahead of them. So they're going to be, if you're exposed when you're very young, you have more years of exposure later in life. <clears throat> so what do these exposures to pollution, and I'll go into in a bit the findings from uh, our Lancet Commission update on pollution, uh, on pollution and health, to talk about you know, what are we looking at globally, but how do these exposures impact us as a society? Well, I, as I mentioned just now, the impact based on individuals will vary greatly, okay? For an individual, um, if it's a child, it might mean that they're sick and they don't go to school. Uh, it might mean that they don't ach achieve educational attainment as much as another peer who's not exposed. For an adult, it might mean I can't go to work today. I'm too sick to work. Um, or it might be I'm not productive at all. I can't, I need to be on disability. It might mean you need extra services. So it means a lot of different things. But when you add it up at the national level, we start to see some pretty interesting and slightly scary results, which are if you have uh, an entire population that has an, on average, a higher blood lead level, and lead is a neurotoxicant, which reduces your IQ, you start to see an entire population of a country have a lower IQ. And what does that mean? That means that your proportion of people that are gifted, that are your entrepreneurs, that are the people who are really driving how things move forward in society is reduced, the number of those people. And conversely, the number of people that might need social services that might not be able to work increases by that same amount. So this is it on an economic level, on a population level is really, really big. Okay. And there's a lot of other uh, impacts that we need to be thinking about if people cannot go to work because they are sick, sick due to edu uh, exposures to pollution that therefore has an economic loss to a, to a community, to a family, and to a nation as a whole, and therefore to the globe. Um, oh, there's just one thing here that I wanted to note, which is the stopping of the exposure risk and eliminating pollution emissions is absolutely key if we want to pre uh, prevent these very large societal impacts. And when we think about reporting on these issues in the media, you know, it's very important that we try to report in a way that helps solve the issue. Um, a, a lot of times litigation is a, a very um, 
exciting and passionate thing to get people rallied up around. But in our experience, sometimes litigation can actually prevent action. And what it ends up causing is continued exposures for a population at risk. So it's very important as journalists that we balance these different types of things and try to improve the ability to solve a situation perhaps rather than uh, making it worse. So that's just a thing to keep in mind. Um, so now I would just wanna go quickly through some of the findings of the Lancet Commission on Pollution and Health. There was a 2017 report and an updated report which just came out in 2022 in May. Uh, the overall takeaways are that pollution is responsible for one in six deaths globally. So 9 million premature deaths each year. This is larger than HIV, AIDS, malaria, and TB combined. It's the same amount as smoking, tobacco smoke, right? This is a huge public health issue of concern and very few people are doing much about it. Um, when we just look at trends, just to go very quickly through, you have an idea of what's going on. The traditional pollution, so water and sanitation issues, household air pollution, those are actually improving quite a bit. Those are coming down. That's that orange line. And pollution from industrialization and urbanization, so ambient air pollution, chemicals, lead exposures, mercury, these are all going up. Economic costs, it's totaling about 2% of GDP globally, and it's costing a lot to the healthcare system. Up to 7% of healthcare costs are actually coming from pollution-related disease. And of course, this is uh, a majority of the burden of this is falling on low and middle income countries that are the least equipped to really deal with the impacts and prevent them, treat them, diagnose them, and mitigate them. I just wanted to show you a quick slide on what we're looking at in terms of the Asia Pacific region. Uh, the slide on the left is all pollution deaths in Asia according to data from the Lancet Commission and on the right is lead pollution um, and poisoning incidences. And so you can see a little bit of variation, but by and large, we have a lot of population in Asia, a lot of population density, and therefore very high numbers overall globally. So Asia is a very important region to be talking about air, uh, all different types of pollution and trying to create buzz around it. I know I'm running out of time here, so I'll just go quickly through a few last slides. Uh, when we look at where these deaths are coming from, the chemical side is one that's a bit underreported. Air pollution does get a lot more reporting. I'm so glad to have a focus here on heavy metals and chemicals. Um, a lot of this is lead. Um, lead, you might think, okay, we've we've covered that, we've dealt with it, we got rid of lead and gasoline, right? A big announcement last year from UN Environment Program, we've phased out lead and petrol, congratulations world, great, one done. Uh, the next big one is lead and paint, um, and there's been a lot of work there now with about 80 countries having regulations around banning lead and paint, but the other sources of lead exposure really will surprise you because one in three children today is lead poisoned and most of them are in Asia, okay, from that previous slide. Um, and the sources are coming from a variety of different things, uh, including unsafe recycling of lead acid batteries, adulterated spices where vendors um, and producers are adding lead chromates directly into the spices to make them look more beautiful, um, and also contaminated cookware. Uh, lead causes brain damage, IQ loss, many, many health impacts. And when I was talking about dose response, you can go back and look at this slide later. The impacts of how much you're exposed to when you're exposed really have a variety of different effects that I don't have time to go into now. Uh, it really does affect us all, and it's something that we really need to be concerned with globally. Um, I did want to just also really touch upon very quickly the topic of One Health, um, which lead pollution, uh, mercury pollution, pesticides, and all of these other contaminants that we worry about um, have an impact on. So climate change is one of the very obvious ones. The burning of fossil fuels is a common source, of course, to both climate change and air pollution. So if we can mitigate um, climate change by eliminating the burning of fossil fuels, that will have enormous impacts for public health. Um, biodiversity impacts, 
the exposures to heavy metals that we know in humans also have a similar impact on biodiversity and perhaps much more complex and much more worrying. So uh, One Health should not just be about zoonoses, but also about what humans do to the environment. So thank you so much. I know that I went over, but it's an important background. I thank you kindly and look forward to your questions. Thank you, Rachel. I don't think you went over, but um, I know there's a lot of information for uh, our participants to digest there. Um, thank you again, Rachel, and your presentation will be up on our website um, very soon. So a couple of takeaways is that pollution, um, especially uh, heavy metal contamination, as what we're talking about focusing on today, does not discriminate, and yet it's not getting enough international attention or global attention, and thus there's not enough attention from the media um, as well, and very little information uh, trickles down to uh, members of the society, the general public. So uh, two important, uh, also two important reports, the Toxic Truth and the report on the Lancet Commission on Pollution Health that you mentioned. Um, Rachel, uh, have revealed some very alarming data about heavy metal contamination. And, 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 and envir environmental pollution is still responsible for about nine premature 9 million deaths per year. And it's largely affecting low and middle income countries. And children are exclusively sensitive to heavy metal exposure with a, a staggering number of 800 million of them having elevated levels of lead in their blood. And that, and that heavy metal is, is more spread out and like you said, ubiquitous than we thought. It, it's present in our food, cookware, toys, cosmetics, it's, it's, all, it's all around us. Um, thank you, Rachel. And now let me just remind you again, uh, the participants, you, if you have any questions for Rachel and, and other experts later on, please put them in the Q&A session. We will uh, feature, we will get to them um, during the Q&A session um, later. So now we're moving on to uh, the second speaker today, Budi Susilorini. Uh, she is the director of Yayasan Pure Earth Indonesia. Um, whose mission is to reduce risks of toxic pollution to human health through approaches which combine research, public education, technical intervention, capacity building, and recommendation to public policy. Budi is a graduate from international relations and has double master de master's degrees in international business and marketing. Budi, um, go ahead. The mic thank is yours. You. <laughs> thank you, for Lawrence. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, dear participants. It's really a lovely to be here. So please kindly allow me to share my presentation. Okay. Uh, again, thank you for this opportunity. As Florence mentioned that uh, my name is Budi. Uh, daily I work as a, the um, country coordinator or uh, director for a local uh, foundation in Indonesia. And for today's um, session, I'm going to share about our experience of working with um, subnational um, stakeholders in central Kalimantan province in Indonesia um, to address the issue of pollution and its impact to um, human health. As uh, Florence uh, introduced me that uh, Yayasan Pure Earth Indonesia aims to mitigate the impacts of toxic pollution um, to the environment and also human health. And as we followed the presentation from um, Rachel uh, earlier, that how severe the impacts of pollution um, to human health, especially to children and also pregnant women. Rachel also mentioned how pollution, uh, for example, like um, um, lead poisoning, they it can decrease the children IQ and uh, it can also disrupt the emotional behavior um, in children. So it is very uh, become very important for pure earth to address uh, the pollution and its impact to um, human health. And one of the um, source that may expose human health um, to uh, pollution is uh, they, if they live in an environment that is polluted, especially with heavy metal. So one of the flagship um, activity that we have been carrying out 
uh, about maybe 10 years uh, or more than 10 years uh, called the uh, toxic site identification program. So we send out investigators train investigators to the um, to the site where we got information that the site is being polluted. So we try to understand the scope scale and also the health um, effects. And also we try to communicate uh, all the collected data and information and then sit together with the communities and uh, the, go the government. We try to make priorities and also try to do intervention. So we are able to reduce the risk of exposure to the from the polluted sites into the human health and um, so far we have already assessed about 5,000 sites globally including in Indonesia and um, Kalimantan is one of the main island where we did the site assessment in Indonesia and Kalimantan is known as so very well um, it is very rich with mineral and coal and in Kalimantan we can also find uh, a lot of the, uh, artisanal and small scale gold miners and as we know they are, they are still using mercury as most of them are still using mercury to recover gold and mercury is one of the um, heavy metal uh, that is also neurotoxin so it is very uh, bad uh, an impact to the human health so this is also something that we have been working on uh, with a local NGO named Yayasan Tambuak Sinta in central Kalimantan uh, province uh, since 2009 we try to work with the artisanal and small scale gold miners to reduce the mercury emission and then um, slowly we tried also to encourage the uh, artisanal and small scale uh, gold miners um, not to use uh, mercury because of the importance to address um, the pollution issues and I think pollution is not an issue that becomes the responsibility of the, um, the government. So, and when we try to speak with, uh, with, uh, with, the, with the government and also with the local sub stakeholders, many times they do not realize about the health impacts that can be contributed for, from the pollution. So we spoke with them and then we agreed that there must be an, uh, an action that must be done in central Kalimantan uh, because of the uh, many uh, pollution issues that they are facing and they want to know about the health impact and how to address and how to make a priority. So as um, Rachel mentioned, GAP has been supporting countries to do health and pollution action planning but for Indonesia, because of our long relationship with the government of Central Kalimantan, and we also have a local partner that we know that they have like a good relationship also with um, local stakeholders, and they also have a, a good um, a grass uh, at the grassroots, uh, which is Yayasan Tambuak Sinta. So we decided to work uh, with the government of Central Kalimantan Province and also Yayasan Tambuak Sinta uh, to develop the health and pollution action plan. Uh, this is a plan where together with the local uh, government and non-government institution, we try to identify, evaluate and make priority of the existing pollution challenges based on um, health impacts and then we are going to do uh, like a priority in pol uh, policy making and then we are going to make like a actual um, intervention to reduce the pollution impacts uh, to human health. So the partnership it, uh, itself comprises of um, several um, institutions including GAP, Oak Foundations and also Swiss Agency for Development and Corporation as our donors. And then uh, we worked together with a local NGO named Yayasan Tambuak Sinta, who created dialogue and engagement with re uh, relevant local stakeholders. So uh, these local stakeholders will have like a ownership toward the project. So they will roll out once uh, we have already thrown all this activity uh, and also they are the one who initially uh, collected data and information 
uh, to be shared with the local um, um, uh, stakeholders so they can start working on the plan. And throughout the project implementation, uh, Yayasan Tambuak Sinta or called uh, YTS is also uh, the one who liaises the project implementation. And together with Yayasan Tambuak Sinta, we work closely with the government of um, Central Kalimantan Province, which in this case is the Agency of Development Planning and Research, or we call it here a Babedalit Bank in um, Indonesia. Babedalit Bank is a local ag ag uh, in government agency who can facilitate uh, communication and coordination with the relevant government agency, uh, including the environmental agency, forestry, health, energy, and mineral resources. So together with the facilitation of Babadalit Bank, we can identify the pollution issues. And then we also uh, form a local or a small working group so that we can make priorities and also try to plan intervention that we can do to address uh, of these priority pollutions. And in addition to these main um, counterparts, uh, we also receive a technical support from a local non-governmental institution, uh, including universities and NGOs, because they have uh, also data information that they contributed to us. And during the multi-stakeholders uh, meeting that we have to, uh, for the uh, planning session, they also provided their um, insight and also input uh, to be included um, into the plan. So the process of the health and pollution action plan itself was started in 2019 uh, with a kickoff, um, which was facilitated initially by the environmental agency of um, Central Kalimantan. But as the discussion went on, we realized that um, the issue of pollution needs like a cross-sectoral dialogue that involves not only the environmental agency, but also other um, relevant agency, including health, uh, etc. So during the uh, kickoff meeting, uh, the government institutions um, suggested to us that um, the continuation of this planning should be facilitated by the agency of uh, development planning and research or Bapedali Bank because they are the one who can facilitate the communication and coordination with all relevant um, agencies within the province. Uh, but during this uh, planning, we also have a, a challenge, which is the biggest one because of the lack of data. Because when we, uh, we talk about the pollution and its impact to human health, because the government uh, has no like a good awareness about the health impact that may be contributed by the pollution. And many times that they did not do any monitoring. Uh, so uh, the, the data is almost uh, nothing uh, when it comes to pollution and its impact to human health. And during the formulation of um, HPEP, we conducted cross-sectoral uh, consultation meetings, including um, uh, working group uh, meetings, small working group meetings, because at first during the group, uh, the, during the kickoff, uh, the government institution or the local stakeholders at that time, they identified about seven pollution issues. And then they agreed about three priority pollution issues that they wanted uh, to address. Uh, and then uh, we formed a small working group to work in more detail for each uh, priority um, issues. And then together, uh, we also have like a big, uh, big groups to determine a short, medium, and long-term goals that we are going to pursue for the Central Kalimantan province. And we, are, we realize that if we do not get support of, uh, from, from the high level um, government, then the health and pollution action plan will stay as a document without um, any execution on the ground. So it is very important to get a buy-in from um, leg legislative uh, body also, and also to get a, a financial support 
for the, from the government of um, Central Kalimantan uh, to be able to um, roll out all the plan that we have been uh, done with the um, with the government of uh, Central Kalimantan Province. So we talked and also we did some hearing with the parliament, the provincial par parliament. And we were glad to share with you that at the end of 2021, the HPEP has been adopted by the medium term plan of Central Kalimantan Province, which will be implemented uh, uh, in 2021 until 2024. So what are three uh, priority uh, pollution issues in Central Kalimantan? The first one is smoke from forest and uh, peatland fires. Uh, this is usually happen during a uh, dry season and he, it has um, impacted uh, the school um, activities and it has also uh, impacted like a respiratory, respiratory um, issues and it also cost uh, economically uh, to the business in central Kalimantan. And the second is a mercury contamination from the artisanal and small scale um, gold mining. So central Kalimantan uh, during our um, literature study for the inventory of ASGM in Indonesia, Kalimantan actually is one of the top 10 um, location in Indonesia that emits mercury from ASGM uh, is one of the biggest uh, of mercury um, emission uh, from ASGM in Indonesia. So in about three, three, 347 tons of mercury emitted from ASGM in Indonesia. So from central Kalimantan itself, it contributed about 21 tons per year from the artisanal and small scale small, small scale gold mining. So it is very huge issue in central Kalimantan. And the third priority is pesticide from farming and agro industry. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, the HPEP has been adopted in the medium term of um, development plan uh, in central Kalimantan. So there are 10 programs as you can see here uh, but due to the limited um, resources, and it is like a five years pl uh, plan. So we came to the government of Central Kalimantan. Uh, in this case, it's the Environment Agency uh, as the beneficiary uh, of this um, uh, project to discuss with them if we have to make priority of these 10 um, um, activities which activity that we want that they want us to support for the implementation so they came to us uh, to prioritize with the, the activity of controlling the hazardous uh, and toxic materials as well as the hazardous and toxic waste so uh, they requested a support from us uh, which means uh, pure earth indonesia and also yayasan tambuak sinta uh, to assist the development or the drafting of the local action plan for mercury um, reduction and elimination, including from ASGM in two regencies um, in central Kalimantan. And as a follow up for, from this local action plan, they also wanted us to work uh, with them to support them with the um, uh, environmental education to raise uh, public um, awareness. Uh, about the uh, pollution hazards and how that uh, how what kind of um, actions that they can do to protect their families uh, from uh, pollution, including for from uh, mercury um, contamination. So uh, not only we are working in terms of the policy recommendation, for policy formulation, and also. We try to talk to the parliament, but we also um, aware about the lack of the data. So we try to also to capacitate um, the local government so that, that they know how to build uh, like a pollution data and how to monitor the database. So we connected uh, the um, local government with Miami University and we conducted a training and we got like a good response from them. So they wanted us to, to do similar um, training for more uh, government officials. 
and also for us to coach them so that they can have like a technical support whenever they are having issues in um, adopting um, the technology or the methodology that um, we train them uh, for their daily uh, work. So during the HPEP planning, we identified some, some information gaps and also we had some lessons learned. So when it comes to data, this is quite common uh, in um, our country that we had like a limited data and especially in subnational government, we also work uh, with the local um, stakeholders to raise about um, their awareness about the pollution and its impact to human health and also how it costs uh, economic, uh, economically to them. So it is very important for us to address um, pollution together with the subnational government. And during the project, uh, we also learned that it is very important to have like a good communication and coordination uh, with the government and also to have also engagement with the relevant stakeholders in this case, not only um, government institution, but also non government institution, including universities and also NGOs and pollution is not um, one agency's responsibility, one institution's um, responsibility, but it needs like a contribution um, and it has become responsibility of uh, many institution and it needs like a cross-sectoral dialogues to uh, to support one uh, one another and as um, uh, Rachel also mentioned that pollution is under recognized so uh, the funding available is very limited so within the very limited funding we have to be able to make my priorities with uh, pollution issues that we should um, uh, address first and when it comes to the intervention we should also to look for like a low cost but efficient um, solutions and uh, during the uh, uh, implementation uh, we also face uh, with um, challenges also uh, the COVID-19 pandemic that uh, did not enable us for face-to-face -face meetings but uh, fortunately we could do um, um, online meeting which is now become a very normal for us to have like a webinar or, or online meetings and it took uh, time for us uh, also to, to to draft and also until it is adopted so it it, it was adopted in 2021 the HPEP so it, uh, it took about two years for us um, uh, to uh, to work with this um, local um, stakeholders but um, it paid up so we are very glad uh, and uh, again, uh, Florence and also dear participants, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to share our experience. Thank you. Back to you, Florence. Woody, that was great. Thank you very much. I'm just going to take on from your words there. You, you couldn't say it enough. It takes a uh, huge work, all levels, uh, many phase of work, uh, a lot of work need to, to get done. Uh, to get all stakeholders to come to an understanding about pollution and its impacts and, and, and that government needs to take the lead of identifying priorities um, and that how you need to know how to work within such limitations, limited data, resources, funding. Um, so thank you very much for that. Uh, Budi, if you have any questions for Budi, please, or any questions for any of the experts, please put them on the chat sorry put them on a q a feature instead of the chat but please do come uh stop by at the chat and say hi to us and we see that a lot of people have said uh hi and hello and tell us where they are now moving on to the third speaker uh unfortunately yuyun is not uh able to attend today but she did send a video to of her presentation a little bit about uh, yuyun she is um yuyun ismawati is a co-founder and a senior advisor of nexus 3 or former uh, known as Bali Focus Foundation, a nonprofit organization working towards a just, toxic free, and a sustainable future. She has a broad and rich experience in environmental health, uh, chemicals, and waste issues, and, and she has a whole shield and environmental engineering bachelor degree from uh, the Bandung Institute of Technology in Indonesia and master's in environmental change and management from the University of Oxford. And my colleague Hannah is going to play her video um, in just a few seconds. Okay. 
Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for EJN for inviting me uh, to this webinar. Uh, in this occasion, I would like to share uh, my works and also my observations in Indonesia and in some countries uh, about mercury impact to the communities. Um, just excuse me to get my presentation. Okay. Okay. Um, my name is Yu Yunis Mawati. I'm the co-founder and senior advisor of Nexus Three Foundation in Indonesia. Um, this is about me. You can read about this later. And this is the outline of my presentation today. Uh, you can get this uh, presentation later in PDF format. Uh, I would like to start with the Minamata Convention on Mercury, which has already adopted in 2013 and also entered into force in 2017. As of the 5th of July this year, uh, this convention already ratified by 137 countries, including by Indonesia in September 2017. In every slide, I will include uh, keywords for every slide. So you can explore further um, this information on the websites and everywhere. Uh, the Mercury Treaty um, have to be for every country who had already ratified the Minamata Convention have to develop the national implementation plan and also national action plans to eliminate mercury in several sectors, priority sectors. Uh, for instance, Arsana small scale gold mining addressed in Article 7 Annex C. And then um, uh, countries also have to develop strategies to prohibit the mercury trade and use um, following the provisions of Article 3 and 4. And then uh, the mercury um, national action plans to control uh, emissions and releases. Uh, and also in Indonesia, uh, the Indonesian government have the, uh, their own initiative to develop the national action plan to control the impact of mercury in human health. That is under the Article 16 uh, and also supported by the Ministry of Health uh, regulation. In Indonesia, the Indonesian government followed it up by um, um, issuing a regulation, the presidential decree that mandated um, provincial levels to develop local action plans to support uh, the achievement of national action plans. Before the Minamata Convention um, adopted and ratified, many countries trade, uh, traded mercury from um, between the region and also across, um, across the, the regions. Uh, in the past, the sources of mercury uh, was from uh, the US and the EU. And uh, before the Minamata Convention ratified um, between this period of time, 2012 and 2015, there are a lot of traffics. If you see in this uh, on this map, uh, you can see different year and different um, traffic between regions. And in 2000, 12, the US already issued the prohibitions to export mercury, followed by the EU. So the source of, of mercury um, after 2013 uh, located in Mexico and uh, Indonesia and uh, elsewhere. Um, in Indonesia, um, we have identified uh, the sources of mercury releases to uh, the environment using um, UNEP toolkits level one. Uh, you can find it online. The toolkits are widely used by various um, UN agencies and also by various countries. Um, and we use the available uh, toolkits online, uh, different versions, different sensitivity uh, over a period of time. So we have these uh, three years uh, three different years of inventory, 2012, 2016, and 2018. And based on our um, explorations, we identified the artisanal small-scale gold mining as the major sources of emissions and releases to the environment, um, reaching out 60%, um, more than 60% of the national emissions. Um, 
and following that uh, inventory, the government also have issued the presidential decree number 21, 2019, targeted uh, priority sectors, uh, energy, uh, health, and then manufacturers and SGM with um, different target time by 2030 and 2025 for additional small scale Um Indonesia imported mercury until 2014. Uh, after 2014, um, Indonesia have um, its own sources from uh, Sinabar mining in uh, Maluku. Um, so we don't see any importation of mercury anymore. And you can find this information about a mercury trade also in our on our website, and also from the UN Com Trade database. This graphics uh, shows the cycle of um, uh, the development of uh, artisanal small scale gold mining hotspots. How it developed um, is depending on um, the information and then the funders or the financiers of the activities and then at some point uh, when they reach um, the uh, high number of, of miners in one place there will be crisis in terms of uh, government um, regulations or limitations or they have a social crisis and then they will move to a new place, um, mining uh, site B. So with this kind of cycles, uh, every cycle will take about, could take about two to three years. Um, and then after that, they will be declining. And after this peak of activities, there will be a lot of uh, abundant um, mining sites. And you can see on the map on the left, uh, we have identified several hotspots uh, in 180 regencies of Indonesia, which also recognized in the presidential decree. Um, why mercury is very uh, dangerous and why there is a um, Minamata Convention why it has to be regulated uh, globally or internationally. It's because the mercury uh, transferred from one place to another place without passport. They could cross uh, borders. And also um, once mercury released to the environment, you cannot put it back in the bottle. So this is one of the examples of mercury roots of exposures in SGM hotspots. Um, miners will use mercury in the ball mills and then they will uh, burn the gold amalgam and the mercury vapor will be deposited in the environment, in the soil, in the fish pond, which eventually human or the communities will eat the fish and the rice. And um, uh, there are a lot of studies about this in Indonesia showing how far or how high mercury uh, concentrations found in human hair and urines and other biomarkers and also in rice. Um, at the bottom you can find uh, several uh, references and uh, the study of uh, done by Nadine Steckling and um, other uh, colleagues uh, found out that 25 until 33 percent of SGA miners globally suffered from uh, chronic metallic mercury vapor intoxication, which is coming from the burning of dental, uh, the amalgam. And uh, once the mercury released to the environment, it will last in the environment more than 150 years. And you can find this evidence also in several um, uh, California gold rush sites, uh, which was the legacy from 1849. You can still find it in an environment. So once the mercury out to the environment, you kind of collect it and put it back in the bottle. And um, children suffered most, uh, as you can see in this uh, chart. Um, there are some effects that you can find in children, and I have seen this evidence also in Indonesia and other parts of, of the world. Um, economic losses due to mercury pollutions um, in Indonesia, uh, calculated by Leotra Sande and his colleagues, uh, cost about uh, 960,000 um, 
annually and up to 1,600,000. Uh, um, so um, this economic losses is not only loss of the opportunity um, in the future to get jobs and so on, but also the loss of um, economic uh, opportunities for the communities uh, to strive. And um, to monitor mercury in the environment, it takes time, it takes resources and energy. And it's not only um, um, mercury in the, um, in, in the human bio biomarkers that's important, but also in the environment, in the air, in sediment, in the soil, in the water. Um, because as I mentioned earlier, mercury is bioaccumulating and then biomagnify in the environment and uh, we conducted currently conducting a project together with the biodiversity research institute uh, supported by the u.s department of state to look at the uh, ecosystem sensitivity and its impact to uh, the communities uh, around the site uh, our preliminary findings uh, shows that uh, mercury in indonesia's environment already um uh, above the safe level and the threshold um and due to limited number of samples we still have to define um what species of fish that have high mercury or absorb most mercury but from the preliminary findings we identified that the sources of mercury are not from fish could be from plants, um, in this case, probably rice, and also from uh, mercury in the air uh, and in the environment. Um, mercury in blood, um, way above the safe level. The safe level is one, um, but at the moment it's more than, um, uh, more than one, so uh, very high. And also um, in, in hair, urine, and uh, blood and all biomarkers already uh, more than 70 percent already above the safe level and if we compare indonesia's uh, biomarkers with other countries uh, consider the second highest um, so this is actually supposed to set um, the alarm for for the indonesian government to take uh, actions uh, more seriously and not only uh, declaring combating the mercury trade, but also react to um, the findings and mercury in the environment as well as in, in human biomarkers. Um, unfortunately, um, the situation uh, like Indonesia is not only in Indonesia, but also uh, happening and took place in many countries. IPEN um, Nexus 3 also participated in this study conducted by IPEN in 2017, um, where um, local NGOs and researchers collecting samples of hair from various uh, hotspots, mercury hotspots in our respective countries. Um, and we collected hair mostly from um, childbearing uh, women age between 25 until uh, 45. Um, in total, we collected samples from uh, 25 countries uh, involving uh, 1,044 women. And you can see in this map also uh, Nepal identified in this map. Uh, later, my colleague from Nepal, Ram, will explain further about their findings in Nepal. But as you can see on the left side, um, there are, this is the map of uh, risk of mercury contaminations based on the global mercury monitoring um, done by UNEP and presented by our colleagues from uh, BRI, Biodiversity Research Institute. Um, from that study, we compared hair from uh, women who lived in the uh, ASGN hotspots in um, global uh, pollution sites and from mixed industrial sites. And uh, the yellow color here are uh, from SGM hotspots and the highest one, uh, unfortunately, from Indonesia. Um, and the highest uh, concentration found in Lombok, um, our project site. 
Uh, however, this figure is uh, using the threshold of one ppm, which is currently used widely, um, uh, introduced by US uh, EPA and also WHO. But researchers found that um, at the mercury level uh, higher than uh, 0 0.55 ppm, fatal neurological damage uh, already observed. So soon we have to uh, propose to uh, the WHO to review this uh, standard to protect um, especially uh, children and babies. So I would like to close my presentations by uh, our lessons learned from Minamata. In Minamata, the Minamata victims or the Minamata diseases victims are still struggling until now to find justice and, and health uh, services. Um, but we learned uh, several points from Minamata uh, tragedy. First is that we have to act on symptoms. We've seen a lot of symptoms of uh, mercury poisoning in babies, in minors. So governments have to take more uh, serious actions to counter this issue and to tackle this issue to prevent further uh, health problems and health degenerations. The second, we have to identify uh, the sources of mercury hotspots and mercury pollutions and stop um, the, the emissions of uh, mercury from that sources. Um, uh, installing um, mercury control devices and stop using mercury in the production process is one of are one of the uh, some of the interventions and then investigate health effects uh, is very important and this will um, link to the health systems in every country uh, how they have to adopt and adapt with the uh, situations and then fourth uh, implement liability and compensations especially if the source um, has been identified uh, from industrial um, activities it will be a lot easier compared to the informal sectors like ASGM. Um, and um, the other two important um, lessons learned are the public awareness and also cleaning up um, the, the contaminated sites uh, in a timely manner. This is the most expensive, uh, cleaning up contaminated sites is the most expensive uh, actions that every government should start um, uh, preventing. And then lastly, environmental monitoring and compliance uh, have to be followed and conducted. And currently at the uh, COP5 uh, Minamata Convention, um, the discussions about global mercury monitoring has been taking place. So I'm um, looking forward for the question and answers. Thank you for your attention. Thank you to Yu Yun there. Uh, we will take Yu Yun. If you have any questions for Yu Yun, we will forward them to her. Unfortunately, she's not be able to join, but uh, a just a few points there that the fact that monitoring mercury takes time and, and energy and requires resources and it's important to monitor mercury, not just in human biomarkers, as Yu Yun said, but also the environment, such as air, soil, and also water. And one of the efforts being done at the moment uh, uh, on a current research with Biodiversity Research Institute is to look at the ecosystem sensitivity and impacts in community, but more data is needed uh, and uh, to, to actually identify the specificity of the contamination. And a large portion of communities directly and indirectly related to ASGM are contaminated above the safe and threshold level. At an alarming level, that is, uh, that declaring a combat against mercury trade is not enough, but actions needed to be taken to follow up the findings of mercury in environment and human. And now, and thank you, we've, we've seen some questions on the Q&A, which is great. We will address them a little later, but uh, before that, our, our last speaker today is Ram Charitra. Ram is an environmental scientist and the executive director of Center for Public Health and Environmental Development. And Ram has more than 20 years of experience in the field of environment, public health, natural resources, uh, management, consumer and labor rights, and occupational safety and health. And Ram holds a, ba um, a bachelor's degree in forestry and master's in environmental science from the Bangalore University. Ram, um, you, can, you can start your presentation now. 
Yes, th thank you, Florence, for the brief introduction. And thank you for giving me this opportunity to share some of the working experience, collaborating with journal, journalism, journalist, especially working in the public health and environmental sectors. So I'll be taking through you uh, uh, my presentation uh, where I briefly share the experience from working with the environment and public health journalist and the brief content of my presentation will be uh, introducing our, our center and uh, with a few examples of successfully pol policy influence on heavy metals. Uh, though I have worked uh, on several heavy metal issues, I'll be more focusing today on two campaign, which is Mercury Free Healthcare Service and Dentistry, which is one of the hot issue in our region, Asia Pacific region. So I thought this may be a good example to share with, and hopefully it will also help other country to take up the similar campaign. Uh, and then we'll be finally coming to the conclusion and then challenges like uh, many of uh, Previous speaker has already said uh, while the working with the campaign for the environment, working for the journalism for the environment and public health, there is always a life threatening funding constraint and pressure from different groups. So that is common. Uh, this is the first slide. Our center is uh, uh, formally established in 2004 with a vision of. Uh, uh, vision of improved uh, environment management and public health and by bridging the people with science technology for the healthy living. We have been doing uh, mostly five kinds of things, research, publication, dissemination, policy influence, and model demonstration. And by uh, doing this, some of our work has been nationally and internationally recognized. And that is the result of working collaboration with people like you, media partners and all that. Uh, I'm try to focus some of the dimension of uh, uh, public health and uh, journalism. Uh, so basically we have the target audience today most of the public health and environmental journalism. And so I thought this may be the good things to share uh, the dimension we have to think about the environmental journal journalism is size of the problem, like starting from national, regional to global scale, like in terms of chemical, uh, which is are the 2017, it was 5 trillion worth uh, business going on on chemical, which has been uh, going to be doubled by 2030. Then other aspect, uh, other dimension of the environmental journalism should be a scale of the impact, like uh, uh, pure earth uh, report, which has been already discussed, one in every children, a global loss, 1977 uh, billion US dollar from lead, uh, 1 billion workers are exposed to hazardous substance, more than 3 million workers die accident and disease. So these kind of a scale of impact. Then another dimension will be vulnerability. Who are the most victim? Human and under human being also, especially the children, women, occupational group, like the dental doctors have high level of mercury exposure from their occupation. Then there is a biodiversity loss, nexus between climate change and chemicals, uh, it has a very positive interaction between climate change factors and chemicals that increase its toxicity, increase its uh, expansion or dispersion from one place to far place from the origin, affected protection. And then credible references always has a very good meaning with the environmental reporting like WHO, ILO, Pure Earth, EPA, EPA and some journal, journals like International Pop, Mail, Lancet, 
and, and most importantly is engaging high profile people up to the victim like prime minister or president, sectoral minister or secretary, celebrities like actor, actress, models, and most you know, important is victim, like who may be the children, workers, community, and environmental component. Uh, according to WHO, uh, like there are 10 chemical, uh, major chemicals of public health concern. And out of 10, four are heavy metals, which is the topic of today. And if you see the right side map, most of them has very huge impact on public health, huge impact on environment and associated huge economic losses to the nation. Uh, so I'm now bring you to bringing you to two basic, uh, basic campaign, which is ongoing in many countries. And we have got some sort of success and where media has played a crucial role, role by partnering with us, taking our evidence-based research finding to the public, to the policy maker. And that is how we able to bring that success story, which I'm going to share with you in a moment. So I'll be taking you through the mercury-free healthcare service and mercury-free dentistry. And a lot of as previous speaker has been already spoken about the impact of mercury, impact of other heavy metals, impact of air pollution, water pollution to the environment, to the public health, and not only the public health and environment, even the uh, flora and fauna cattle has equal level of severity from all these chemicals. So we start from data generating, and that is through biomonitoring of mercury in different target groups. So Fisher folk, dental healthcare professional, uh, again, the second batch of dental healthcare professional and female with childbearing age. So, and the, in this, in all these biomonitoring, we have strategically uh, able to engage high profile government official, the upper picture, who was the dental doctor by profession and who hold, who was holding the apex government position in the Ministry of Health. So he was secretary and dental doctor by profession. So we took, hair sampling to do the mercury exposure testing of him. The second picture you, can, you see, he was the second man in the Ministry of Environment, which is the focal ministry for the uh, Minamata Convention on Mercury. And he, he, he was not the dental doctor by profession, but he has three dental amalgam filling in his mouth. So we have taken their some hair sample get tested the mercury in it uh, and report back their result back to him and then based on their own personal exposure of level finding uh, ministry of health under his leadership has taken very progressive decision even before minamata convention has adopted so it was adopted in 2013 October, but our government of Nepal, Ministry of Health and Population has already banned import, purchase and use of mercury-based equipment in not only in public health sector, but even the private health sectors. And as a result, there was almost no mercury based equipment are being used at the moment in public health sectors. The second decision, which is very progressive decision made by once again, by the Ministry of Health is banning of use of mercury dental amalgam in children, pregnant and breastfeeding mothers, even curriculum development of dental college and banning in practice of dental uh, amalgam, even for the academic sector uh, has been adopted by our Ministry of Health. 
And as a result, there was a huge leapfrogging improvement in the, in the practice sectors where almost all dental doctors has left practicing mercury dental amalgam. And they have shifted to the alternative, uh, to the composite glass inomer, compomer, which is widely available, equally reliable at the moment. And there are huge media support. Uh, they have taken this, all these masses up to the grassroots level and maximizing outreach. In addition to that, as our colleagues, uh, uh, Yuyun was mentioning about the ASGM sector where, where the biomonitoring of mercury has been uh, found to be very high and similar uh, things has happening in case of Nepal. We don't have ASGM, but we have the similar process adopted for doing the metal uh, gold plating on the metal statue. And, and uh, Indonesia, country like Indonesia, Thailand, China, India, Nepal, Burma, Bhutan, even Arab country have a lot of monks, monks and temples uh, and, and then uh, these kind of uh, uh, monastery where a lot of gold plated items, artifacts has been kept. And it, if it is mercury base, there is a huge impact on the workers. And we have tested 20 female childbearing age workers working in the gold plating using mercury base uh, process. So average mercury was 3.6 ppm, whereas maximum was 28.46 ppm in a worker's body, which is more than even the workers who work in the ASGM sector in many countries, including Indonesia. So these, these are the findings of biomonitoring at the workers level. And out of 2015 has got which is 75% has got more than one PPM. So this is the real condition and need to be, therefore these, these kind of vulnerable, occupationally vulnerable group like workers need to be protected. Uh, we, have, we have others uh, campaign like lead in paint where a lot of media uh, partnership or media coverage right from disseminating the level of lead in paint up to the what will be the best uh, value or standard should be fixed. And then post standards, we have the media campaign even for the compliance monitoring. So media has played a very crucial role in shaping several chemical safety policy, including uh, including uh, heavy metals, lead, mercury. Uh, this is the cosmetics, another where media has uh, high, high, highlighted this chemical in cosmetics. And as a result, we have the cosmetics standard at the moment. Uh, so regional and global policy uh, influence has been made through partnership with the media. So these heavy metals policy influence pushed by the media reporting in different countries trigger different, different regional and global policies. For example, earlier WHO and Minamata Convention have not recognized mercury in dental sectors as a problem, but now they have come up with the resolution. They have come up with the amendment even in the Minamata Convention, whereby they recognize the, the, the effort of different countries brought through the media partnership, such as banning the use of mercury dental amalgam in children, pregnant and breastfeeding mother. And this, this kind of initiative has already adopted by WHO and Minamata Convention of Mercury, which has the not only regional level influence, but even globally, they are now pushing for that with the, all their member countries. And finally, uh, I came to the uh, conclusion where 
from I, I thought that promotion of research base, like environmental journalism, should not be on the on the dilution basis. It should be should be evidence based. So research based, evidence based awareness capacity building, policy influence, model development and working together with the concerned public and private, as well as media partnership. Most vulnerable children, youth, women, occupationally vulnerable, increased and continued support and responsible action with the help of country, organization and individual to bring the desired improvement and elimination of heavy metals, persistent organic pollutants, chemicals and waste and these these all are for healthy, toxic free future and better environment and meeting multiple sustainable development goals like poverty reduction, health, gender, water, citizens, and food, sustainable consumption and production, et cetera. And uh, thank you. And my final message will be work responsibly and collab collectively for the better environment and toxic free future. Uh, and I will stop here. If there is any question, I'll be more than happy to answer. Thank you. Thank you, Ram. Um, uh, there's a lot to take in there, but if we, we can circle it back to most of the participants we have today, after all, this is, we were trying to uh, um, help journalists to, uh, to tell the story better out there, if just you know, uh, so it's no longer about the problem. So there are many lenses of which you can you need to look into the stories, like you mentioned, the scale of the problem, yes, the impacts, yes, but also who are people the most vulnerable, and um, and having credible references in your story, and uh, of course, uh, uh, engaging high profile uh, high profile uh, personalities, um, uh, uh, policymakers, people who are actually have the power to change, and. And so let me, so we have uh, several questions and I think this is a question that um, all, all panelists can answer um, in the local, may that be a local level, regional level, a global level, is that uh, why do you think there is a limited attention to the topic of this uh, pollution of heavy metal pollution? Uh, why is it not taken seriously? Or is it, has it been taken seriously? If, if, if yes, then uh, what is the, why? Is you can you can see have, have been doing a great job at pushing um, at, uh, the reporting triggers uh, pushes for a better policy and pushes for um, uh, standards and and the adoption of, of uh, compliance. So uh, is there any perception out there that is not a real threat despite the data on the deaths? And I think I would like to each of the of the panelists to to answer here. Um, we can start with Rachel as well because you did point out that this is this is not getting enough at, uh, attention. And and how can they whip more impact of heavy metal pollution into their reporting, Rachel? Thanks, Florence. This is an excellent question. So I want to take it on some of these different levels. Um, limited attention at the individual or family level is certainly a concern. Many of the families that we interact with, you know, are focused on their immediate needs, which is, you know, food and income for their family, right? Um, so some, in some cases, families do know that their livelihood activities are poisoning um, their families or themselves, but they don't have other choices in other places they don't know. So there is uh, very little information generally on the dangers of lead pollution or mercury exposures um, as the panelists have presented. At um, kind of the national level, in terms of public attention, there is typically insufficient level. Although there are cases such as the angry moms of Pakistan and other places where women's movements and citizen movements have generated a large amount of attention. Um, and certainly there's need for much more kind of grassroots demand and advocacy and holding government agencies and industry and polluters to account. At the uh, national level in terms of government response, many of the 
government agencies who are responsible for regulating or enforcing pollution regulations simply don't have enough capacity or enough budget, but they are well aware of the limitations of their ability to respond. And at the international level, there is growing attention. The Lancet Commission on Pollution and Health, the recent update, the Toxic Truth, many, many publications have come out. Uh, UN Environment is doing a lot on it. So the attention is growing um, and the media attention and coverage of these reports has been absolutely instrumental in bringing global attention to the problem. I'll stop there so others can go. Thank you. Maybe Budi, if you can give us a little bit of extent uh, uh, of your experience um, uh, dealing, but I mean, we, we know we know you've done a lot of work with uh, stakeholders locally in in Kant Kalimantan. But what about engagement with media? Yeah. As Rachel pointed out, um, Florence, uh, media engagement or media contribution to make people aware about the pollution and how they can protect themselves and also their families is also important for uh, media to deliver. So they are not pointing fingers uh, to the um, um, to the actors, but also how that the communities also can help or to support the government if they have see like a pollution that may endanger the communities that they can report to the government. So it is uh, very important. And I just wanted to add what uh, Rachel pointed out about how this pollution, sometimes it connects with the uh, livelihood of the communities. In the government perspective, it may be a, a quite a dilemmatic because um, um, more or some of these um, pollution came from informal activities. So it is very uh, quite um, difficult for the for the government because when it comes to informal, they are more on the formal side. They are um, looking into 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 industry with their permits. So it it will be easier for government to give sanction to the licensed um, industry rather than informal. So it makes uh, it makes like a pollution become more um, uh, difficult uh, to address. Um, Florence, thank you. Thank you. And uh, Ram, you have, uh, it, through your slides, there have been many examples of how media, uh, how what kind of role media plays here, right? And uh, it, so it seems that there is a, a great relationship between the policymakers, the uh, uh, stakeholders that are dealing with pollution, with the media in Nepal. If you if, do, you want to give some some pointers, uh, share some some uh, best practices for uh, participants out there, uh, because we have journalists from other countries, and maybe this is something that that can be emulated in their in their in their uh, local communities. Uh, I see that there are three four important points how media uh, participation can be increased and should be increased. Like uh, in most of the country, in Asian culture, there is a lack of citizen science. There is science, but there is a lack of citizen science. So most of the research has been carried out by different institution. Most often it does not reach to the public. It does not have access to the journalist. And without facts and figure, if, if any journalist write about the pollution, it doesn't make much difference. So science evidence-based environmental reporting can come from the citizen science. Thereby, I, I hope that that kind of science will increase where access to information to the journalist access to information directly to the public or through the media outreach based on the availability of the evidence should be encouraged. Uh, I know that there is a right to information act as a fundamental right adopted by many countries in the constitution, including ourselves. Uh, recently, ILO has adopted occupational and safety as a fundamental right. But the, it has to be practically translated into the country level, into the regional level, into the low, up to the local level, so that people have real feeling of getting strengthened or informed 
and without information one cannot take the good decision so for having best decision to protect our health first we should know about its bad and good and that will come through the citizen science through the media so these are the things and one most important sometimes media should be also always unbiased on influence so there will be the truth reporting unbiased reporting evidence based reporting untwisted reporting should be coming from media side as well so that people have the trust they can believe the message they can share with the broader so these are the few aspects need to be uh, integrated of science journalism and then public health together to enhance the impact and thank you ram try to do that to some extent we are right. uh, bringing a lot of changes through the media partnership all right thank you speaker so if you have uh, i know there are some questions that will be unanswered but uh, you have the context we were also able to share with you the context of panelists today we're very happy we will be very happy to connect you uh with uh, other organizations that are doing the same thing and uh but before we go uh i would like to just uh, for each of the panelists to give a 30 seconds of final thoughts before before we wrap up uh today's webinar rachel Great, thank you so much. Um, this is a really critical topic. It's you know the biggest cause of death on the planet globally, and it's important to be able to place it within the context of all these other public health concerns and other development priorities. And so, as we go about reporting and raising attention, you know this is always something to keep in mind. And of course, GAP is here to answer any questions. Please do reach out directly or through Florence. Thank you. Thank you, Budi. Thank you, Florence. So I think we here all, all agree that pollution has huge impact to human health, uh, as well as um, economically and socially. So it is very important for us to work together um, to address um, pollution and it will uh, and to do uh, intervention. And it should be um, started by having and sharing um, reliable um, data. And I think all stakeholders can take part in addressing pollution issues. Thank you. Thank you. Well said, Budi. And Ram, your uh, last 30 seconds, final uh, thoughts? Uh, actually, the topic we talked about heavy metal is just a tip of iceberg in the whole chemical industry. So it is just the beginning, I said, and it has to be continued uh, since there are a number of things, each and every things we tested has come up with the great evidence or very serious findings. Like recently also we did the thalates in eraser, which is the every child is going to use in their preschool times. From, from the preschool times, it has been highly loaded with the thalates in all Asian countries. So the, the things like this has to be continued uh, with the larger and larger sectors. And I think this is the first good beginning and we keep on rolling on that. Thank you, Ram. Speaking of continuous, yes, like I said, this is just our first uh, webinar. So please stay, tu stay tuned and, and log on, uh, check out our website for uh, the follow-ups of this webinar um, on environmental uh, contamination and, and health and pollution also in general. Thank you so much. And we will be sharing with you the presentation, the contact of our panelists and the recording of the show in the coming uh, coming days. And thank you for, for being here. Thank you for staying with us. And thank you to all the panelists, and we will see you in um, the next uh, webinar. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.